This is March 15th, 2014 on our calendar here. And on the Hebrew calendar, the 13th day of, a, of Adar 2, 5774. And of course, this is Spiritual Warfare, Part 5. Last week, I talked about civilian mindset versus military mindset. The way the scripture describes spiritual warfare, it describes it in very militaristic terms. And in fact, um, in Ephesians where it has uh, the armor, Rav Shaul uses what he knew of armor during his day uh, from the Romans, okay, as, as illustration. And so, as we come to this topic, we need to ask the Lord to help us to shift in our mindset from a civilian mindset in dealing with this particular issue to a more military mindset. Otherwise, we're not going to understand what is being said to us and required of us to do. One of the things that I meant to bring up last Shabbat and forgot to do it was in a military setting, it is drilled into you that when you go out to battle, you're not just fighting for yourself. You're fighting for others. You're fighting for your battalion, the men, the team that you're with, you know? The other thing that they, that they make sure that you understand is you don't fight alone. You know, you are part of a brotherhood. And, and these, all of the members of this brotherhood, they care about all of the other members, or that's the way that it's supposed to be. Yes, amen. Okay? And, you know, there, there are things that they teach you like no one gets left behind. Even if the person is dead, they will try to go in and extract the dead body if they can. Um, and at some point, even if that means that they have to come back days later, to get the body, they'll come back and get the body. Um, the other thing that is drummed into you in the military is everyone has to do their part in battle. And if we don't do our part, then others suffer as a result. And so everybody else on that team, whatever size it may be in the military, is counting on you. And in the body of Messiah, we have not had this mentality. Come on. We haven't. We've had an individualistic mentality that says, I can do whatever I want, go wherever I want, say whatever I want, and it's just me. I can go to this congregation because they have these programs over here, and I like those programs. And it's all about me. Okay? And that's one of the big problems with the body right now. It's it, in the Jewish community, and, and you notice we say the Jewish community. In the Jewish community, that's what it's about, community. There's much more of an emphasis placed on the corporate than on the individual. Okay? We are a corporate body. And that's why the scripture says that when one person suffers, we all suffer. Amen. And that what we are supposed to be engaging in is... When someone else is sad, 
we need to be sad with them. When someone else is joyful, we need to be joyful with them. It's to be a group effort. It's not individualistic. Okay? And so, when we, when we beg off because we have the individualistic mindset, when we... And, and that individualistic mindset could actually be because of things like... It may not be simply because, well, I'm, I just want to be on my own, but it could be from things like, nobody likes me. Yeah, rejection. And nobody likes me, nobody ever talks to me, they don't care about me. And so, that gives me an excuse to be by myself and to, to extract myself from the corporate. We, there is no reason, there is no excuse that is acceptable for extracting yourself from the corporate. That is why we are instructed in the scripture that we are not to disengage from fellowshipping with the body as it says, as the habit of some is. Okay? It is a, it's a command, folks, that we are to be in fellowship with the body. Okay? So we don't get to, we don't get to be lone rangers. In, in the body of Messiah, there, there are no lone rangers. It, it troubles me when I hear, and I understand why people do this. I, I, people email me or whatever and tell me, you know, we haven't been going to any congregation for years. And it's because, you know, and they'll, whatever, it's, we don't like this or don't like that or, you know, something else. And it's, it's like, I understand, you know, if, you're, if the... If the leader of your congregation is teaching false stuff, then you don't need to be listening to somebody who's, who's a false teacher. You know, I understand these kinds of issues, but that doesn't let us off the hook from being in fellowship with the body. God's not okay for us to spend years at home on Shabbat doing our own thing. He's not good with that. Okay? Now, with, with that in mind, and I, and, and I brought that up because I missed it last Shabbat and I wanted to emphasize those things. With that said, I want us to move on now to uh, some of these things that are done within the spiritual warfare movement. And I know that this first one is going to step on a whole bunch of toes. So I'm just, I'm telling you up front. <laughs> I've actually heard it here. Okay? And again, this is not, it's not like something like, um, oh, you bad person, you know, you're in great sin or, or anything like that. It's just, I'm sharing with you, this is something that is said often, but that we really need to remove from our spiritual vocabulary, okay? I plead the blood. Okay? And the, by the reactions of people's faces, I can tell you're going, wait a minute, what? Okay. What is that now this is not dangerous. It's just misinformed. Well, first of all, you have to ask the question. When you say I plead the blood, what does that even mean? I mean, what 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 does that mean? I'm not going to I'm not going to go so far as to say it's a nonsensical phrase, but it doesn't really have any meaning. Okay? Um but usually, when a person says, I plead the blood, or let's plead the blood over somebody, or something like that, what they're saying is, is we need, 
my desire is to see that person protected, okay, from something, what, whatever the something may be, okay? So, um, it actually would be better if we, if we were to ask God for divine intervention yes. and supernatural protection yes. in that person's life, then use this term, I plead the blood. Okay? Because when the, the spiritual warfare movement coined this phrase, and they mean a particular thing by it, okay? But, like I said, it really doesn't have any specific meaning. And if you're really, truly wanting protection for someone, you need to ask for protection. Right. Amen. Okay? Don't, don't just be throwing these phrases out that, that you, don't, you don't know what they mean. They don't really have any meaning. Okay? So, here's the interesting thing, is the term or the phrase, blood of the Lamb, is only used twice in the entire Bible. Okay? And in every case that the blood of sacrifices or the blood of Yeshua is talked about, it is only referenced in terms of the removal of sin. It's never employed for protection in the Bible. Okay? There's never ever a time in the Bible where you say, I put the blood on you to protect you. Okay? So, I want, to, I want us to take a look at some passages in the Scripture. The first one I want us to look at is Kepha Aleph, 1 Peter, chapter 1. First Peter 1, 17 through 21. Through 21. It says also, if you are addressing as father the one who judges impartially according to each person's actions, you should live out your temporary stay on earth in fear. You should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life which your fathers passed on to you did not consist of anything perishable like silver or gold. On the contrary, it was the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah as of a lamb without defect or spot. God knew him from the founding of the universe, but revealed him in the Acharit Hayamim, or in the last days, for your sakes. Through him you trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your trust and hope are in God. And so this talks about the blood of the Lamb, but specifically, I mean, it doesn't use the blood of the Lamb, uh, that phrase, but it's, it tells us that we were bought with the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah as of a lamb without defect or spot. Okay? And so, this scriptural reference about talking about the blood of the Lamb specifically has to do with the removal of our sin and bringing us into the kingdom. The two passages that actually use blood of the Lamb specifically are, found in the, are both in the book of the Revelation. Chapter 7, verses 13 through 15. Revelation 7, 13 through 15. One of the elders asked me, These people dressed in white robes, who are they and where are they from? Sir, I answered, you know. Then he told me, These are the people who have come out of the great persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. 
That is why they are before God's throne day and night. They serve Him in His temple. And the one who sits on the throne will put His Shekinah upon them. Now, obviously, white robes indicate purity. And so it says they washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. This is the removal of sin by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Revelation 12, 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come God's victory, power, and kingship, and the authority of His Messiah. Because the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before God, has been thrown out. They defeated Him because of the Lamb's blood and because of the message of their witness. Even when facing death, they did not cling to life. Therefore rejoice, heaven, and you who live there. But woe to you, land and sea, for the adversary has come down to you, and he is very angry, because he knows that his time is short. Okay? The word, some of the translations say that they defeated him through the blood of the Lamb. The, word, the Greek word that is used here is the word dia. If you're transliterating it, it's D-I-A. Dia. This word specifically means because of or on account of. Okay? Not through. And there's a big difference. In other words, what is being said here is that the power and the authority that the enemy had over these people was defeated because of or on account of the blood of the Lamb and the message of their witness. Okay? Which, what it's saying is, it, when we say message of their witness, it's not just talking about speaking. Okay? What it's telling us is Hasatan is defeated in their lives as a result of them trusting in the blood of Yeshua and then living a life of godliness and holiness. Okay? So it's, it, it doesn't have anything to do with like somehow applying blood and by applying blood in some kind of supernatural way, then the enemy has to go somewhere, okay? Um, which is kind of what the idea is, is if I, if I quote-unquote, if I plead the blood over someone or something, then the enemy's not going to be able to touch him. Well, there's not any scriptural basis for that at all, okay? <clears throat> So again, just to, just to reiterate, since I'm saying don't do that, what do we need to do instead? We need to ask for God to intervene in their lives and to cover them with supernatural protection. Okay? The second and final thing that I want to address is what in the spiritual warfare movement is called the power formula. And it's the phrase, in the name of Jesus. Okay? The way, the way that in the name of Jesus has been presented by the, specifically by the spiritual warfare movement is almost as if saying in the name of Jesus has some kind of magical qualities and that just by simply saying that the enemy is going to react in some way 
in a negative way, okay? And um, that, is, that is not the case, okay? Uh, now, I will say this. Yeshua's name, just His name, does have power, okay? But it's certainly not magical in any way. Um, and there are, I have known people who have been in situations where that's all they could get out of their mouth was Yeshua. Maybe once, or Jesus, okay? Maybe once, but maybe because they were under attack by someone or, or in an automobile accident or something like that. And miraculous things happened. But I have to ask the question, were the miraculous things that happened a result of them actually saying His name or simply because God intervened in their life and saved them? Amen. I mean, there is no proof that just saying the name was what did it. Okay? So, I, I want us to begin with some scriptures that we're going to read and then analyze. One of these is one that I, I have brought up numerous times during the course of this study, trying to, um, you know, use it as an illustration of warning. But I want us to look at it in detail and analyze the passage. Let's go to Acts chapter 19. <coughs> I'm, I'm sure there would, but I don't really know what the Hebrew word is. Yeah. <clears throat> Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 17. <clears throat> I'm just going to read through it first. And then we'll, we'll come back and look at it in detail. It says, Then some of the Jewish exorcists who traveled from place to place tried to make use of the name of the Lord Yeshua in connection with people who had evil spirits. They would say, I exorcise you by the Yeshua that Shaul is proclaiming. One time... Seven sons of a Jewish Kohen Gadol named Skeva were doing this. And the evil spirit answered them. It said, Yeshua I know, and Shaul I recognize, but you, who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit fell upon them, overpowered them, and gave them such a beating that they ran from the house naked and bleeding. When all this became known to the residents of Ephesus, fear fell on all of them, Jews and Greeks alike, and the name of the Lord Yeshua came to be held in high regard. Okay? Now, let's go back and pick this apart. First of all, it's interesting to note that this passage begins by talking about Jewish exorcists. Yes, yes, there, there were Jewish exorcists and they would cast out demons in the power of God. You, you have to understand something. This is while Yeshua is still alive. He hasn't gone to the cross yet, okay? And God knew that they would have to be dealing with demonic entities so at this point in time, they don't understand to, or up until this point, they don't understand to call upon the name of Yeshua in order to cast demons out of people, okay? They had been practicing this prior to Yeshua even been, being born. So they're calling upon the power of God to deal with these demonic entities, okay? So... These guys, they have seen other people 
employing specifically Yeshua's name. And we'll get to the name issue. I'm just going to say name right now. Employing Yeshua's name to cast out demons and to heal people and so on and so forth, and they've seen it work. And so they're going, well, let's let, we're going to start using it too, okay? Because it works. So that's the reason why they started doing this. The problem is they were not authorized to use Yeshua's name because they were not followers of Yeshua. They had no relationship with Yeshua. Okay? Now, let me, let me address, you know, the power of this demon. This shows how powerful demons are. This demon that's inside this man gave him enough power that this one man whipped the tuchus of seven men. Beat them up, ripped their clothes off, sent them running naked. Okay? So if you have any doubt about the power of demons, doubt no more. Okay? They are extremely powerful. All right. Now, let's talk about the issue of the name. Okay? I will recall you your remembrance back to other messages that I've given through the years about the, about the issue of the name, of a name, okay? And because our society doesn't do what the Hebrew society, at, le at least what they did at this point in history, we don't have an understanding or a concept when we read in the name of, we don't have the concept here of what this is actually talking about. This is not saying that they simply said in the name of Jesus that, or in the name of Yeshua that just by saying that phrase that anything happened. Instead, in ancient Jewish thought, a name conveys a person's character, their nature, their essence, their reputation, and their authority. So when you said, in the name of, what you were saying was, I'm operating in the authority of this person. Okay? That's why these guys had a problem because they were making the statement to this demon, we're operating in the authority of Yeshua, and the demon comes back and says, oh no, you're not. And I know you're not. I know Yeshua, and I know Shaul, but I don't know you. Okay? So, the issue was, an, it was an authority issue. And so just because a person says today in the name of Jesus doesn't mean they carry, carry the authority of Yeshua to be doing what they're doing. Can you bring judgment on yourself in the name of Jesus? In the name of uh, Yeah, we, we're, I, I did something last Shabbat. I guess I should have repeated it today. But... I have, like, I'm sorry, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, but, but I've put, like, a kibosh on people commenting or asking questions during the message because it, it very rapidly gets out of hand, and everybody, then everybody wants to start talking, and it's just not working. So, so sorry, I, I didn't say it before we started, but um, in answer to your question, the Scripture does not indicate, in fact, it actually says you can say things bad and against Yeshua, but you do not dare say evil against the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, um, anyway, back to what I was saying. Um, so if, just because you say in the name of Jesus, 
doesn't mean you carry the authority of Yeshua. And personally, we know of preachers, and I've brought one particular man up to you guys on multiple occasions that was run out of the state of Texas, Robert Tilton. He's now operating in Florida and hasn't been kicked out of there yet. But we know his history. Um, uh, Ted Pierce, the singer, who used to be part of the worship team at Baruch Hashem in Dallas, out of which this congregation was born. Uh, Ted Pierce is a good friend of ours, and he actually used to work with Robert Tilton at a car dealership. And he used to listen to Robert on breaks and lunch times, planning along with the guy that ended up being his right-hand man for the Word of Faith Church in Dallas, scheming and planning about how they were going to start this church in order to make money. And that's what it was all about from the very beginning. Okay? That man no more had a relationship with God and with Yeshua than the man in the moon. But he frequently employed in the name of Jesus. Okay? And people, we know people who attended that congregation that, that came to the Lord, that got healed, that had their finances turned around, that got new jobs, etc., etc. All of these very positive things sitting under the quote-unquote ministry of this man. Okay? But what I tell people is, it's not about that man. It's about God and what God wants to do in people's lives. And so God, and, and you know, I talk about the fact that if God can use a donkey then he can use any human being, whether they're redeemed or not, to, to accomplish his will. And, and to even say things that, that are the truth. Um, there is great truth in some of the teachings of the false religions. And truth, truth is truth. And falsehood is falsehood. And... No matter who brings forth the truth, it's still truth. No matter who brings forth the falsehood, it's still falsehood. Those two things exist because truth comes from God. Falsehood comes from Hasatan. They are static. They just are. They just exist. Okay? And so, the unfortunate thing is that even though there may be truth in the false religions they mix the truth and falsehood together, and that's what causes the problem, okay? But what I'm trying to get across to you is that God is going to move and operate according to His will, okay? We, we don't, He doesn't give us the ability to employ a magical statement to get Him to do something for us. Okay? He will not be controlled like that. Okay? What we get to do is we get to ask Him for something. And then it's up to Him as to whether He will do according to what we have asked or the way that we've asked. Okay? And a lot of times He says no. And that's His privilege because He's the Creator God. Okay? So... The use of His name without relationship and or without instruction and authorization to use it amounts to lawlessness. And where do we get that from? We get that from Matityahu, Matthew chapter 7. We're going we're gonna to read this through and then, then break it down and analyze it like we did the other one. Matityahu, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23.
Yeshua says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. This, this Greek word means master or someone, someone who is in control. Okay? So these people, by the use of the Greek, this particular Greek word, these people are coming to Yeshua and identifying him master or you're the one who controls me is, is their claim. Okay? So Yeshua is saying, not everyone who comes to me and says, Master, you're the one who controls me, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Why? The stipulation is this, only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. Okay? On that day, many will say to me, Master, Master, didn't we prophesy in your name? Okay? In other words, didn't we prophesy making use of your authority? Didn't we expel demons making use of your authority? Didn't we perform many miracles using your authority, then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Okay? Now, what is so amazing about this is that Yeshua is saying not everyone who believes that I am the one in control of them, that I am their master, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the, and the qualifier is, the reason they're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven is because they're not doing the will of the Father in heaven. Okay? And He, he does not dispute with them about their activities. Okay? He doesn't ever tell them, you didn't do all of these things that you said you did. Because they did. Okay? They made use of His authority to accomplish these things. But it's like what we read in Acts of these sons of Sceva. Okay? They took and used that authority to accomplish these things but they were not given the authority to do these things. Okay? And so they, they took it upon themselves to do these things in His name. Okay? So when we do that, Yeshua says, if you do this, no longer, I mean, okay, let's ask the question. Is it good to prophesy? Yeah. Yes. Is it good to expel demons? Yeah. Yes. Is it good to perform miracles? Yes. All of these things are good things. And yet Yeshua I identifies them as lawlessness. For one simple reason. You didn't get permission first. And unfortunately, unfortunately, the end result is we don't get to be with Him. Okay? That is serious business. And He says, I never knew you. In other words, there was no one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and me. If there had been, you would have come to me and asked me, if I should do this or that or the other thing. But you never came to me. You never asked me. You never got permission. You just went out on your own and did this stuff in my name. And I'm telling you, because you did that, it's lawlessness and you, you get out of here. I don't, want it, I don't want you around. Okay? That is horrible, folks. I know I don't want to be guilty of that. And the danger, 
within the spiritual warfare movement is that is exactly what they're teaching people to do. And it breaks my heart because you know how many people are caught up in the body of Messiah, in the spiritual warfare movement? Hundreds of thousands of people are doing these things. And oh my goodness, when these teachers have to stand before God and answer for what they've taught, I would not want to be them. The stipulation is only those who do the will of my Father. So we need to ask and gain permission and authorization to employ His name, His authority to any situation unless that authority has already been granted by the Bible. And there are some things that the Bible clearly says in black and white that we have the authority to do. Okay? And we're going to get into the specifics beginning next Shabbat on the things that we can and should be doing in spiritual warfare. Okay? But one of the things that I said a few weeks ago, when it has to do with you personally, with the things that you possess, with your family members, we have the authority to address the enemy in those situations and say, get out of this situation. You have no place here. Okay? Unless your family member, and this is, this is a caveat, okay? A very important one. If your family member has invited in some way those demonic entities to be involved in their life and they're not willing to change, they're not willing to do what's necessary to get rid of them, you can talk and do everything until you're blue in the face and it's not going to make any difference. Because they are allowing the enemy to be there. And you cannot overcome their will. Okay? We don't have the ability to overcome someone else's will. They have to choose to want to be released from the power of darkness. Okay? Now, what I want you to understand is I'm not saying that it's wrong to say in Yeshua's name. Okay? You can make use of that phrase. However, if, if we know that we have said authority to do so. Okay? And the example I would give is in this setting here as the rabbi of the congregation. Okay? I can stand up here as representative for all of the people in this room because God has placed me in this position of authority and you have made the choice to place yourself under that authority that God has given to me. And as such, I can take authority for everybody in this room and what's going on in this place, on this property, and so on. Okay? However, I wouldn't be able to go down the road to some other congregation and apply, try to apply that authority in that congregation. I don't have authority in that congregation. The pastor of that congregation has the authority. Okay? So it all has to do with where are we authorized, where are we not authorized. And we need to understand and know it's not just automatic. I can't teach you and send you out there and tell you just go to town throwing your weight around in Yeshua's name and dealing with this demon and that demon and some principality over that city and some... Guys, don't be doing that stuff. Okay? You are endangering yourself and your family by doing that. Okay? 
I want to finish with, first of all, by telling you that I'm not going to say the name of the author in this video because, remember, I said a bunch of names in part two and we have decided, because I mentioned those names, not to put that particular video on YouTube. Now, you all heard it. If you want the message, it's going to be on the audio CD that you'll get. I would ask that you not spread that around to everyone simply because we did name a whole bunch of people that are involved in the spiritual warfare movement. But one of the authors, the main author, and the main proponent of this particular movement made the statement that he was aware that after all of this teaching and training that they do to people and tell them what to do, in 71% of the cases, what they have told and trained people to do does not work. 71%, folks. Now, if you were just simply looking from a logical standpoint, wouldn't that tell you something? Okay, so in the other percent where it actually does work, we have to assume, or I'm assuming, that God has chosen in His own will and His own power to do something in that situation no matter what the other people did. No matter what they said, no matter what, whether they said, I plead the blood or in Yeshua's name or whatever, God chose in His sovereignty to do whatever it is that was being asked. Okay? <laughs> and I want to finish by, I can name this person. Uh, this is John MacArthur. In his book, Ashamed of the Gospel, When the Church Becomes Like the World, this is a quote. It says, Biblical correctness is the only framework by which we must evaluate all ministry methods. Any end justifies the means philosophy of ministry inevitably will lead to compromise of doctrine despite any proviso to the contrary. If we make effectiveness the gauge of right and wrong, how can that fail to color our doctrine? Ultimately, the pragmatist's notion of truth is shaped by what seems effective, not by the objective revelation of Scripture. In other words, if you, if you take the stand that I'm going to employ this, whatever it is, because it seems to work, rather than whether or not it's scriptural, you are going to be led astray into all kinds of off-the-wall stuff. Why? Because you've disconnected yourself from the foundation. You've disconnected yourself from the standard of measurement. This is the standard. This is like a ruler. Okay? We can't just arbitrarily, you know, I've got a paper back there that I wrote many years ago called The Standard. Okay? And it uses the illustration of the fact that we have to have standards of measurement in this world in order to accomplish the things that we accomplish. In, here in America, we use inches as a measurement. I can't just arbitrarily today decide that I don't like the fact that an inch is that long. I'm going to say an inch is from my elbow to my wrist. Okay? I don't get to do that. Because the standard is an inch is like that. Okay? And so if I were to employ a different standard... You know, Rick and I worked together to, to build this place, okay? If he was using 
a tape measure and how it calculates an inch, but I, I decided I was going to use some other kind of measurement, guess what? This building would be crooked and, you know, nothing would have been square or straight or plumb. Okay? So I don't get to do that. In spiritual things, we don't get to do that. Okay? This is the measuring tape. And if what we're doing isn't following this, then we're off base. And we will, once, once we move away from this as the standard in just one instance, then in other areas of our life, we will begin moving away from this. Okay? This has to be the standard for what we do. That's why these teachings are so dangerous, is because they have, they have basically manufactured something on their own, apart from the Scripture, and in some cases, actually in opposition to the Scripture. And that's the most dangerous. And so, next Shabbat, we will actually begin talking about, okay, we've talked about the things that we shouldn't do. Now, let's talk about what we should do. Um, so, I hope I made it clear that we can, if we know that God has given us authority, we can say in Yeshua's name, or you'll notice that I say in Yeshua's authority because that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about just saying the name Yeshua. We're talking about acting under His authority. You know, if, um, and I've used the illustration about the highway. If I go out there on the highway and try to stop an 18-wheeler mm -hmm. dressed in these clothes, I'm probably going to get plowed down. But if I, if I go to the police and they deputize me and I put on a uniform with the badge and the whole nine yards, I can step out there on the highway and tell an 18-wheeler to stop, and it will stop. And that, that's because I have the authority to do that. Okay? So, anyway, let's go to the Lord. Abba, we thank you for the clarification that is coming forth, the revelation. Father, I don't, I don't think that I could live with myself if I knew that I was leading people astray into falsehood. And Father, I know that there's probably some things that I believe and that I do that I'm misinformed on. But Father, it's, there's not any intentionality if I present those things. And Father, I just ask for myself and for the benefit of all of these people that you have placed under my care, Father, that you'll continue to reveal those things which might be hidden, those things which we might be doing that are not appropriate for us to do, that I would be able to teach these people that you have given to me to care for, that I would be able to teach them the truth of your word so that they can rightly employ it in their daily life, with the people around them, that they might be effective for your kingdom. Father, if we've been given the instruction as your followers to do tikkun olam, to repair the world, Father, we need all of the tools necessary to do that. And we need to employ them correctly. We don't need to be hammering a nail with a screwdriver. And so, Father, we... 
we ask that you teach us what to do and how to do what you've asked us to do. In Yeshua's name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav alecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.